So what did you check out this month? I started out watching American Ninja from 1985, which I enjoyed so much that I immediately followed it up with American Ninja 2, The Confrontation from 1987. These were canon movies, so they simultaneously feel hyper-American and super foreign at the same time. That's a great way to describe canon films. I went in expecting just a dumb, enjoyable kind of background movie that I could kind of laugh at. And when the first movie started, that's what it felt like. But then as soon as you got to some action, I legitimately became interested. There was some really cool stunt work in the first movie in particular. Good creative action scenes. The movie itself is nothing special as far as kind of a, a film as a whole, but the action stuff makes it worth watching. It was very enjoyable. It's set on an army base where the main character is a soldier who nobody else seems to like. And uh, at first he seemed really douchey. He doesn't talk and he just has a really dumb expression on his face. But as it goes on, you start to find out more about him. And it turns out that he has all these super martial arts skills, but he doesn't know where they came from. He doesn't know what his background is because he's missing some of his memories. And as it goes on, you kind of find <laughs> out about that. And there are ninjas that keep attacking everybody. And from what I remember, I wasn't paying super close attention to the actual plot, but I think they were trying to steal a missile from the army base to sell to a foreign country or something, maybe multiple missiles, I don't know. Uh, but it was a very entertaining movie. I liked it a lot. The action was really cool. And the main guy actually did most of his own stunts, and he was pretty impressive, especially when I read that he didn't have any martial arts experience before filming the movie. Maybe he did. But he just lost some of his memory. <laughs> yeah, that's possible. The second movie was not as enjoyable. If you like the first one, you'll probably still like the second one. And I did like it, but the stunts weren't as good. It's more of just kind of normal hand-to-hand -hand fighting, where the first movie had more, like... The, some of the first movie felt like it was inspired by Mad Max, because you have stuff with cars and people jumping on cars and getting run over by cars and stuff like that. It was cool. And the second movie is more hand-to-hand -hand stuff, which was still good. But about two-thirds of the way through the second movie, it suddenly took just a sharp turn into a sci-fi movie, which I was not expecting at all. There was no setup for it. But it turns out that the main bad guy in the second movie, this is not a direct quote, but he says something like, he's, he's talking to all these other bad guys in like a secret hideout or whatever, and he says, we're going to build the world's largest drug cartel. As if it's some kind of super high goal to aspire to. I think he has his hands in the air even when he says that. And it turns out that for whatever reason, he decides that in order to do that, he needs to genetically engineer an army of super ninjas that can run as fast as cheetahs or whatever. And at one point he says they're as strong as a 10-ton crane. I don't know if he means that they can lift 10 tons or, or what he means by that, but that's what he says. So what's the outlandish part? <laughs> <laughs> And, and those super ninjas are in, uh, they're in holding tanks. You unfortunately never actually get to see them fight or anything. But the other ninjas that they have are also all genetically engineered and supposed to be superior to everybody else. But when he's demonstrating them to the other bad guys, one of those bad guys goes down into this arena to fight some of them, and he's just killing them left and right. You know, there's like 20 of them against him, and he's killing them everywhere. But the guys next to the head bad guy are like, wow, those ninjas are amazing. Where did you get them from? But they're all being <laughs> slaughtered by everybody. And even when they're actually out in the field fighting the other army guys and stuff, they keep getting killed everywhere, but they're supposed to be the, the super terrifying ultra, ultra ninjas. Is this a rushed recap contender? They were enjoyable. I would definitely recommend them to people, but they weren't quite the right movies for something like that. What about the third and fourth one? Are you going to watch those? Uh, yeah, I, I'll watch them eventually. The main guy is not in the third one. He didn't want to get typecast or something as an American ninja. But then he came back for the fourth one. Yeah, I think so. All right, what about the fifth one? Looking them up, I got a little confused because I think there were a couple of sequels that had the same title or something like that. Or there was a sequel by the same director, but it wasn't called American Ninja or something like that. It was a little confusing, but I'm definitely interested to keep going on with these. From there, I went to 1982 and watched a movie called Zedder, a.k.a. Revenge of the Dead. This was an Italian movie that I thought was a zombie movie because the DVD cover looks like this. <laughs> the setup for this movie was interesting. This guy gets a typewriter for his birthday or for Christmas or something, and when he pulls off the ink ribbon, he can see what the previous person typed on it, and it turns out to be something dealing with reviving the dead. 
and it turns into a mystery where he's kind of trying to track it back and figure out who the guy was and what he was talking about, but it ends up being pretty boring because nothing else really happens. The entire movie is basically the investigation, and you do get a couple of people being revived, but if you add up all the footage in the entire movie of people that are brought back to life, it's probably less than five minutes of the entire runtime. What does Zedder mean? Uh, it's the name of a character. Oh, okay. So yeah, it, it ended up being really boring. I, I honestly struggled to get through it. I watched the English dub because I think that was the only version available, and it just was not interesting. It was It was really boring and hard to follow. And then when it ended, I legitimately was super surprised because I, I was expecting something to happen, and instead I just got the credits. So yeah, I would definitely skip this movie. I watched Psycho from 1960, which I've seen a bunch of times before. One of the few slasher movies that I actually enjoy, and that I actually think is a good movie. Oh, stop it. You love Jason X. <laughs> the only other slashers that I actually like are Friday the 13th Part 6, which makes fun of the rest of the movies. Um, I do like Part 7, because it throws in the, the psychic girl angle, which is interesting. And then The Terminator, which I would say is basically a slasher, just turned into a sci-fi movie. What about Alien? Oh, I mean, that's kind of, I, I guess you could say that's a slasher. Yeah, I could see that. But I mean, that's more of a, that's a little, that's a little outside because it's such a, such an inhuman thing. And the Terminator's not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I could see that. But yeah, Psycho's really good. One of my favorite Hitchcock movies. It's got a couple twists in it. So if you've never seen it before, don't look anything up before you watch it. Seems wild that some people could not know the twists in Psycho. Well, the person I watched it with didn't didn't know any of the twists. Hmm. I, I feel like it's, at this point, with the way modern people are, everybody focuses so much on modern stuff, and uh, there's less of a sense of history or context to earlier movies, and you don't really see older movies on TV the way you did, like, when we were growing up, so... That's true. I guess streaming services have kind of taken over, you know? Yeah, that too. Yeah, everything is everything's different, which is unfortunate in some ways. You sound like an old man. I feel like an old man. Back in my day, if we wanted to know what was on TV, we had a channel with this really slow scrolling thing, and if you missed your channel, you had to wait for it to come back around. I forgot all about that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> After watching the movie, I read a short story by Robert Block called The Real Bad Friend from 1957. Oh, was it an autobiography that you wrote? <laughs> No, it was the partial inspiration for the book Psycho. The Real Bad Friend. That sounds like a young adult library book. Or like a like an episode of like a kid's show, where it's like, don't be that friend, or watch out for that kind of friend. I definitely think the title was intended to be somewhat comedic. Um, there is a sense of humor to the story, and it's basically about a guy whose friend keeps telling him that he should leave his wife and take all his money and go to live in the Caribbean or whatever. And uh, before doing so, to kind of use it as, as an excuse to leave his wife, to drive her crazy first and put her in, like, you know, in like in an asylum or something and then leave. And the psycho connection comes in when you find out the identity of the friend, which I'm not going to spoil in case anybody wants to read it, in case anybody has seen Psycho and is intrigued by that. It was a pretty good story, and I liked the way it was written, and I liked the humor in it. If you like Psycho, definitely check it out. But the story itself is completely different. It's more the ideas behind some of the characters that come up in Psycho. I watched Flesh and Blood from 1985, which was Paul Verhoeven's first English language movie. That's pretty much why I watched it. I was intrigued to see what he was going to do with it. Wait, is that the one with Rutger Hauer? Yes. Wait, I watched that too. Okay. I honestly don't know if I enjoyed this movie or not. I guess I did. It was more interesting to just to watch as a as a movie as as opposed to something that I really liked. It's definitely kind of depressing in terms of everything that it deals with. Uh, so basically, you've got Rutger Hauer is a mercenary who is part of a group of mercenaries that were kind of screwed over by the guy that hired them. This king that had them uh, attacking a city. They, he told them that they could take whatever they wanted from the city, and then once they took it, he kind of said, "You know what? No, I'm taking it all for myself." So they said, well, okay, we're going to kidnap the woman that your son was supposed to marry, who's played by Jennifer Jason Lee, and the movie becomes the king's son going after them and trying to rescue the girl, and the girl doing what she can to survive, and kind of a love triangle between Rutger Hauer, the girl, and the prince. 
and the plague is going on in the background of all this. There was no good character in this movie. Nobody was on the side of good. When you thought, oh, this is the person that's going to be the hero or the person who steps up, they would do something terrible. And you say, oh, I guess not. Yeah. Like I thought the prince was going to be that, but then he was a dick. <laughs> and then I thought the girl was going to be that, but then she was a bitch. And I thought Rutger Hauer was going to maybe rise above, but he was an asshole. Everyone was just a jerk. Yeah. And did terrible things. It reminded me of Game of Thrones kind of in that way, where depending on what's going on, your uh, sympathies are kind of with different characters. Or maybe not even sympathies, but who you want to win in a situation kind of depends on the situation. Yeah, and by the end, I didn't want any of them to win. Yeah. I thought once it got to the stuff at the very end with the prince and uh, Rutger Hauer fighting, it went on for way too long. I, I kept thinking, okay, that character's dead, and then they would pop back up, and it just kept happening over and over again, and I thought it, it got a little unintentionally goofy. How about the part where the prince was chained up, how he broke <laughs> his chain to get loose? Oh, man. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Yeah. There were two moments that, that totally broke the realism for me, and that was one of them. What was the other one? The other one was when they're trying to get into the castle that Rutger Hauer's people are in, and they build, out in the field, they build that giant thing with, like, the fire oh, truck ladder yeah. with all the giant gears and levers, and, <laughs> oh, man, even just looking at it, it looked so dumb from the outside, where it's supposed to look like they kind of cobbled it together, but it just looks fake as hell. And that kind of reminded me of uh, when the wildlings are attacking the wall, and they build, like, the, the giant turtle thing to, to kind of hide under to approach the wall. I don't know if you remember that. No. Okay. What happened? I thought something else this movie did was really accentuate how gross everything <laughs> must have been back then. No sense of hygiene. Everything was just disgusting. All the people were so disgusting. So it was very accurate in that way. Yeah, I would throw just a lack of decency into that too. Right. Because you have so much just blatant casual rape and murder and nobody seems to care. It doesn't bother anybody. Even that scene where... Jennifer, Jason Lee, and Rutger Hauer were taking a bath. I was like, you're not getting clean. You're just, just <laughs> stewing in a bunch of filthy water, and you're gross, too. Yeah, but I did appreciate that they made the people look really gross, too, which you wouldn't get in a Hollywood movie. Right. And uh, the music, right from the beginning, I was thinking Conan the Barbarian, and it turned out it is Basil Polidorus, but it felt much more generic, and it, it didn't kind of, there wasn't anything that stuck with me or that made me say, I want to go listen to that again. So that was kind of disappointing. We talked about the plague going on at the same time, and I thought it was really funny when the one general dude found the girl who was dying of the plague, and he found out when he put his hand on her back and one of her yeah. pustules exploded and it was all over his hand, and he goes, hmm, and then he smears it all over his face. <laughs> I, I thought he wasn't supposed to have noticed yet. I, I, I had to I did go back and watch that part again because I was confused. But it wasn't like it was a little bit. It, it, it took up his whole hand. It was disgusting. Yeah, I, I think I can't remember. I think he was already he, he, he was already wet or something and maybe he didn't notice that what it was. You know what it made me think of. It made me think of Planet Terror mm. when the dude <laughs> bursts the pustule on his face and smears it all over Josh Brolin. Yeah, but he did it to himself. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like they didn't need to go that far to show how he got infected. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ending where the prince rescues the girl and they write off heroically or whatever, there's nothing heroic about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was probably intentional. You know, it's kind of like at the end of RoboCop, it's supposed to be a happy ending or whatever, but OCP is mm -hmm. still super corrupt and in charge of everything, and they still totally f***ed up Alex Murphy. Well, I read that after Paul Verhoeven made this movie, and it wasn't very successful, it convinced him to move to America to learn how to make an American movie. Hmm. I would not have guessed that that would be the, the the decision you would make after that. Because I was really excited when I found this movie, and it was like Paul Verhoeven right in that period when he was making awesome stuff, and I'd never heard of it, but I was kind of disappointed after I finished it. Yeah, I think part of it for me was that it didn't quite feel... Like, it had as much money as it needed sometimes. Just cer certain parts of it felt a little bit cheap. Yeah, they could have afforded a shower here and there. <laughs> Maybe some toothpaste. And then I, I think one big theme to mention is the, the whole kind of religion angle, where pretty much all the characters 
claim to be kind of fighting for God or whatever, but then they're all just blatantly murdering everybody and just, you know, doing everything for their own selfish reasons, which I guess probably was pretty realistic for people of the time or for nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, by the time the movie was over, I, I kind of, it, it doesn't leave you with anything other than a feeling of kind of grossness, I think. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't, I, would you recommend it to people? Who would you recommend it to? Maybe more from a historical context, not really a film experience context. You mean like historical as in the period that it's set in? Yeah. Because see, I would have said more just to people who are curious to see what Paul Verhoeven did before making American movies. Yeah, but not walking in with high expectations. Yeah, but it's, at the same time, it definitely wasn't bad. It's not that it was a bad movie. It just didn't really have anything to connect to, I think, as the viewer. And I think from beginning to end... There wasn't a lot of character growth or plot development. It was very centered and didn't really go in any different directions. I, I kind of disagree because I, I the whole time I was kind of wondering what Jennifer Jason Lee was thinking and what she was, you know, whether she was telling the truth about certain things or what she was going to do, which side she was going to go into. That was the one, mm. the one thing that I kind of, she was definitely the most sympathetic character if there is such a thing in this movie, because she did horrific things too. Yeah, and I, I think if it hadn't dragged on for so much at the end, where it, it should have ended, and I thought it was going to be over, and then it kept going for another, like, five scenes, I think it would have been a lot better. I watched Kickboxer from 1989. This was a Van Damme movie. A year after Bloodsport, nowhere near as good as Bloodsport. Basically, Van Damme's brother is injured in a fight, and Van Damme then decides he's going to go train so he can beat that fighter. And that's pretty much the whole movie. I was impressed with Van Damme's acting for some of it. He does some really good crying scenes. <laughs> what a weird thing to <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it, it was legit impressive. But then so much of the dialogue was really bad. So much of the rest of just the movie was not good. That sounds good. <laughs> The fight scenes were choreographed and directed by Van Damme, and they were definitely better than the ones in Bloodsport, but the movie itself was not that great. It was pretty much what you expect the entire way through, and kind of dumb, honestly. So I, I would say skip this one. All right, I'll check it out. <laughs> from there, I watched The Fog from 1980, my third favorite John Carpenter movie after The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China. I think this movie is great. This is basically a like a 50s EC Comics style ghost story. And I think uh, all the suspense building scenes are really effective. All the scenes with the fog and with the ghosts, I think, really work. The visuals are really cool. I think the way this movie handles the fog on the visual side of things is way more effective than what the mist does with the mist, partially because it's not CGI, which it was sometimes in the mist. Isn't it true that there was a lot of headbutting between John Carpenter and the special effects guys during the making of this movie? Uh, not that I remember hearing about. I thought it was because things took so long to set up. I know that was the case on The Thing. Maybe that's what you're thinking of? Maybe. Because um, for this movie, initially, a lot of the scenes with the ghosts were not in the movie. John Carpenter wanted to keep it more suspenseful and kind of in the background and mysterious. But when they tested the movie, it didn't test that well. And they kind of said, well, we need to stick in some more stuff like that. And I definitely think the movie is better with it, because I think those scenes are some of the best scenes in the movie. But they're all pretty simple. It's There's very simple makeup and basically just the fog stuff, so I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I really like this movie. Uh, my only real criticism is Jamie Lee Curtis pops in as kind of a hitchhiker who becomes involved with everything, but she's only involved as a bystander. She never does anything important, and the movie would have worked exactly the same way if she wasn't there, because she just hangs out with Tom Atkins the whole time, and he could be doing all the same stuff by himself. So her character just feels completely pointless. Seems like a move a non-Carpenter director would take, to say, oh, here's a cameo from this person in one of my other movies. Yeah, I, I really don't know why she was in there. Maybe that's maybe that was the thing. Is she, she asked if she, you know, if he had another role, and he was like, well, I'll write you into this movie. I don't know. Might as well throw Stan Lee in there. <laughs> From there, I watched a, I don't know if you could technically call it a documentary, but I watched a, a, a video called Dynamations, Dinosaurs in the Wild. Dynamation back in the 90s, I guess they started in the 80s, uh, they were a company that would make robotic 
dinosaurs for display in museums and stuff like that. And I remember seeing a ton of them in museums as a kid. And I even had a bunch of trading cards and stuff with all the different dinosaurs on them. And this video, it presents itself as a video about dinosaurs, but basically it's just a huge propaganda video for the company. And even then, it's it's pretty poorly put together. It's mostly just footage of these robots. Who is it made for? Who's the target audience? That's a good question. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it was something made to sell the robots to people that would buy them. It seems like it's for kind of kids, I guess, but that doesn't make sense. I don't know. It was weird. And it was very poorly put together. A lot of the supposed factual information isn't even accurate. It was, yeah, there's no reason for anybody to watch this movie unless, like me, you're obsessed with dinosaurs and you fondly remember seeing Dynamation stuff as a kid. It's not good. Yeah, so... Like the inaccuracies in the number of servo motors and actual dinosaurs. <laughs> They're probably totally inaccurate. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've learned a lot about robotics and dinosaurs since then. So. And robotic dinosaurs. Yeah. And I don't know what year this was from because I watched it on YouTube and I couldn't find any other info. So, yeah. Do you think it could have been an internal thing? No, because it, it has these moments where it'll say myth, and then it'll give you some myth about dinosaurs that has never been a myth because nobody would ever say something so stupid, <laughs> like Tyrannosaurus only ate Triceratops. It's like, what? Who, who would say that? That doesn't make any sense. Even the dumbest kid would say, well, there were other dinosaurs around, and then they'll debunk the myth that they just made up, and then the video will go on to more footage of these robot <laughs> dinosaurs. That's an interesting model. I think pathetic is the word I would use to describe the whole video. <laughs> From there, I watched The Terminator from 1984. Great James Cameron movie back when he was making great movies. And again, one of the few slashers that I actually enjoy. For anybody who has seen any of the newer Terminator movies and not seen the first two, completely forget about those new ones and just go back and watch the first two because those are really good. They're so good. And they're the only ones that are worth watching and they tell a complete story. I mean, even the first one tells a complete story, but the second one really builds on it in a really effective way and then brings it to a solid conclusion. And that's all you need. One of the weaker points in the first one, even though he doesn't say anything really, is Arnold's acting... Mostly his facial expressions. I agree, but I also think, uh, I mean, you don't know in the first movie that much about the Terminator and how it works. I think in the second movie, they kind of thought that out a lot more and said, this is how it should be. This is how you should act. Yeah. Because in the first movie, he does kind of show emotion at times. He looks angry. You know, his eyes go wide and stuff like that. He does that eyebrow raise, but he doesn't have any eyebrows because they've been burned off at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you don't get that kind of stuff in the second movie. It's much more kind of flat, even face. Um, well, he kind of gains emotion as the movie goes on, but that's because he's learning. Yeah, I've seen the movie. I know. <laughs> so yeah, everybody should watch this movie if you haven't seen it already. It is excellent. And also marvel in the fact that the same guy did the score for both of them, but the first one feels like a very sci-fi, techy synthesizer score, and the second one is a much more cinematic score. Yeah. And they're, but they're both good. They both totally work for what the movies are. Yeah. I mean, every time I see someone on a motorcycle in my head, I'm just like... Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> from there, I watched Office Space from 1999. Really? That does not seem like a movie you would watch. Really? I love Office Space. Well, I was going to say, this is one of those movies that a lot of really dumb people quote all the time. And it's really irritating when they do that. But the movie itself is actually really good. I mean, it's Mike Judge. I love King of the Hill. It's one of my favorite shows, period. Right. But because this movie's so popular, usually that dissuades you from watching things like that. Yeah, that's true. I, I think I f had first watched part of it on Comedy Central back in the day before I had ever heard of it. And that's probably why I was willing to watch more. Uh, but I have seen it before. I've seen the whole movie a few times, and I like it a lot. See, the fact that you even watched Comedy Central is weird. <laughs> Yeah, I, it probably was just on in the background, and I just wasn't, you know, purposely watching something on there. So the movie basically is about a guy who hates his office job, and uh, even from the beginning, everything is portrayed very comically and over the top and kind of satirically, and uh, he goes to a therapist that is supposed to kind of hypnotize him into not worrying about things, so he ends up just not worrying about anything, and his attitude ends up helping him in his job. There are kind of some, some company consultants that come in and, and decide that he's 
kind of management material. But then it turns out that some of his friends are being fired and they all kind of conspire to kind of steal money from the company, but in a non-illegal way, kind of, maybe. And yeah, the whole movie is really funny. You've got Stephen Root, Gary Cole, Ron Livingston. They all do a really good job. It's the only movie I actually like that Jennifer Aniston is in. You like Leprechaun. Don't even pretend you I don't, don't even like Leprechaun. The, the lep- Leprechaun is not good. Uh, but that is also the only other movie I've seen Jennifer Aniston in. I know you've got the complete Criterion Friends collection. Oh, don't man. Even don't d- no, like don't, don't even freaking mention Friends to me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is a movie I would recommend to literally anyone. This movie is great. I watched The Evil Dead from 1982 which we did a whole video on already. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, so we talked a lot about it already. This is one of my all-time favorite movies. One thing I, I will bring up that we didn't mention in the video is I think the movie is really smart in the way it handles windows. And that probably sounds weird at first. I'm on a Mac myself. <laughs> there are windows all over the place in this cabin, and the this demonic force that you keep seeing its perspective when the cameras kind of zoom in everywhere, it's outside. And you have characters looking out the windows because they hear noises and stuff. And you have characters at various points get grabbed through the windows. But as the movie goes on, you you always have scenes where characters put their backs to windows or they hear a noise and it's coming from a door somewhere, but they walk right by a window to go examine it. And there's even a scene where the one guy leans out the window and the camera goes right up to his face, which again is kind of evoking the way the camera is moving around from the demonic perspective. But he doesn't see anything. And, you you know, you can kind of wonder, is that the demon or is it just a camera in the movie? And I, the movie does a really good job with kind of having those windows everywhere all the time. And you're constantly knowing that something could pop out. You know that things are outside. Even though it does make the characters look stupid, it works for the movie for building tension to have them constantly kind of ignore these windows that things keep happening outside of. So you're saying they could have avoided this whole supernatural confrontation if they just used linux (laughs) take out my mac one i like that one better (laughs) okay so yeah this is another movie that i would recommend to anyone who is a horror fan if you're a film fan i would say this is a movie you should watch especially for the way the camera is used it's just incredibly creative the whole way through and super engaging because of that. It's not so much what's happening in the movie, it's the way the movie is put together. But what's happening in the movie is cool from a horror perspective. And it's a testament to how good it is because this is not a big budget movie. Yeah, and that's part of why they were forced to be so creative. And it totally paid off. This movie is awesome. And I think you can see in, when you look at more recent Sam Raimi movies, he's got all the money in the world and that level of creativity just isn't there anymore. Um, You still get some of the humor that he would, you know, inject into his older movies, but the creativity isn't quite there anymore, which is disappointing. Well, yeah, the more money you get, the more your creativity is neutered. Potentially. I mean, I think it depends on the person and what they're trying to do, but that's definitely the case with Sam Raimi movies, unfortunately. Hey, if you gave me $50 million and said, I want you to make a What We Watch video, but you can only talk about shitty movies, it'd pretty much be the same as it is now. But (laughs) I'd be making more money. (laughs) I watched It Came From Outer Space from 1953. This was a Jack Arnold movie who I think is probably the best 50s sci-fi director. Uh, He also directed the first two Creature movies, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Tarantula. He did some good stuff. This movie was based on a Ray Bradbury idea. Uh, He kind of wrote a screenplay that was then rewritten into this movie. So Richard Carlson, who was in Creature from the Black Lagoon and the Valley of Guanji and some other movies, he plays an amateur astronomer who goes with his fiance to investigate a meteor impact, and it turns out to be a spaceship. The alien inside kind of uh, keeps seemingly attacking people and then taking over their bodies. So it's kind of like an invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing in a way where you have people that look like their normal selves, but they're acting weird and clearly working for this alien. And Richard Carlson and his fiance are the only ones that know about this. Nobody else believes them. And it turns out the aliens are... The whole time they keep saying that they're not malicious, that they basically just want to get off of Earth, that they landed here by accident. And that's basically the movie. I honestly thought it needed more in the way of story to make it more interesting. 
because you kind of just get a bunch of scenes of, oh, now these people have been taken over, and these people have been taken over. And the whole time Richard Carlson's just trying to convince people, nobody believes him, they keep making fun of him. So it was a little bit disappointing. It was also a weird viewing experience because I didn't think I had ever seen this movie before, but as it went on, I kept remembering things. But yeah, it just, I can see why I didn't remember it, because it really is not that memorable, other than just the fact that the aliens are not evil. That's kind of interesting, I guess for a 50s sci-fi movie, but the story itself was just not that great, in my opinion. But it was well made. Jack Arnold knows what he's doing, so it just needed a better script, I think. No offense, Ray Bradbury. That's all I watched. Last month, I talked about reading The Island of Dr. Moreau from 1898. This month, I read The Daughter of Dr. Moreau, which came out this year. This was written by Silvia Moreno-Garcia, who is a pretty popular author right now. She's pretty big in kind of a, like, literary sci-fi fantasy, I guess. And I wanted to check out something by her because her books... Something I can say about her books that I can't say about pretty much any modern books is that they look really good. The cover designs are great, and most modern books just look like absolute crap. And unfortunately, that's pretty much the only good thing I could say about this book. The idea behind this, I was hoping at the beginning, was that it was going to be a prequel to The Island of Dr. Moreau because it is set earlier, and you do have... Montgomery, who was Moreau's assistant in the original book. Uh, He's basically the same character in this book, but this is kind of when he first comes into Moreau's employ. But it turns out to be completely just a reimagining, I guess, that really is about the daughter character, who is being treated by Moreau for some kind of condition. She's being injected with some kind of jaguar-derived serum. And uh, from the start of the book, you already have a bunch of hybrids that Moreau has created, and this book is set in Mexico. It's not even set on an island, actually. Even though they in the in the book they keep saying uh, it looks like an island, but it's not actually an island. It's like okay, what what's what's the point of even bringing that up? And honestly, that was the question that I asked through the whole book was what's the point? The plot of the book ends up being the guy that has employed Moreau to create these hybrids. I'll get to the reason why he's creating the hybrids in a second because it's really dumb. But basically, the guy's son comes to visit and. The daughter and him end up kind of having a connection, and Moreau wants them to get married because that way he'll have a steady stream of income. And it becomes kind of a love triangle between the daughter, the son of Moreau's employer, and Montgomery, who is Moreau's assistant. And it basically just ends up being kind of a a romance, but a really shallow one, where the characters are written very simplistically. Um, I guess Montgomery kind of had a little bit more to him. Uh, The whole book goes back and forth between chapters from the daughter's perspective and chapters from Montgomery's perspective. And at the beginning of the book, that was really irritating because you would get the same scenes from both characters' perspectives, but without actually learning anything new. Instead of getting the opinions or the reactions from the other character, you would basically just get kind of a flat description of the same thing that you just read before it catches up to the the next scene that's going to happen. Thankfully, as the book goes on, it stops doing that. But then you have kind of weird things where it felt like the author kind of forgot whose perspective a scene was from, and you would kind of almost seem to cut to a different character in the middle of a, of a scene. And you had a lot of scenes where multiple characters are talking, and they'll be talking about Dr. Moreau and his experiments. And Dr. Moreau is there in the room, and they're saying all these negative things about him and about his daughter and whatever, and you never, you never get a reaction from him. It doesn't even go over to say he looked angry or he looked whatever, or, or even a line of dialogue until the very end of the scene, and then everybody else leaves, and then Dr. Moreau stands up, and it's like, oh yeah, he was in that scene too. And then he doesn't react to anything that just happened in the entire chapter, and then just kind of walks out. Ah, so it was really irritating. There was no connection to any of the characters, really. And of course, uh, it turns out the daughter when he's injecting her with the with the jaguar stuff. It turns out she's actually another one of the hybrids that he created from a kind of combination of jaguar and human or whatever. And the hybrids themselves were a big disappointment too, because they're introduced at the very beginning of the book, and then they almost don't show up at all until the end of the book, with the exception of maybe two of them that are much more human than the others. And the whole time this is going on, there's kind of a background of what's going on in Mexico with the British and the French and the all these other different people that are kind of fighting each other and there's kind of a group of rebels that are supposedly living in the jungle nearby and it does a really bad job of setting all that up because they kind of will mention things but you don't really get a a concrete sense of who's where or what's actually happening until it actually pops up in the story and suddenly is important but only for one scene and then the book will just go on and the reason that dr moreau is making these hybrids is the dumbest part of the whole book 
Well, no, actually, there's one dumber thing, um, which is at the end when the, the daughter turns into a were-jaguar, basically. She starts mutating into a jaguar in the middle of a scene, and then but then she goes back to human when she calms down, and it keeps going back and forth. And if this was a fantasy book, I would say, okay, sure, but it's presented as a straight science fiction story that even tries to be more realistic than the original Dr. Moreau by having genetic engineering be the explanation for things instead of vivisection. And it just, it does not work. Um, especially when the book has been relatively realistic up until toward the end when she start, suddenly starts growing claws and, and fangs and stuff. But the reason Dr. Moreau is creating these hybrids, the reason the guy that's, that has hired him is paying him to do this, is because he needs workers for his fields or whatever the hell he's doing. I don't even remember. But he needs workers. He just needs laborers. And somehow he decides that it would be cheaper and easier to pay one random guy out in the jungle, out in the middle of nowhere, to turn animals into people by himself than it would be to just bring in slaves, which they even say is an option, or to just hire other people that already exist. <laughs> it, it makes absolutely no sense. It was the dumbest possible explanation that I could have imagined. And uh, yeah, it just contributed even more to my lack of enjoyment of this book. So... Yeah, I would definitely say skip this book. Based on this one, I would not be interested in reading any other any other of the author's books. Um, not just because I didn't like the plot, because the plot is going to be different in other books, but because the writing style did not work. There were too many scenes that were unclear as to what was happening sometimes. There would be scenes where it, it sounded like a character had left the, the area, and then all of a sudden they would be getting shot by a character that is there in the scene on the next paragraph but i thought they were gone already and stuff like that it just it just was not well written so yeah i would definitely say skip this one very disappointing all right i'll check it out i read showcase presents batman volume 6 which covered batman stories from batman and detective comics for almost all of 1971 and 1972 is that the Rachel ghoul stuff yes this is a pretty highly regarded era among batman comic fans mostly for the Rachel ghoul stuff the stories by Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams in particular, but the two of them were also working on Green Lantern, Green Arrow at the same time, and I thought those stories were way better. I found this volume to be a big disappointment. I wouldn't necessarily say I thought it was bad, but I definitely didn't think it was very good. This is still in that era after the TV show where DC said we want to get away from the villain of the week thing and all the goofiness and try to make it more serious and dark and more like the Golden Age stuff. So there aren't really any classic villains that show up. I think the only one that shows up is Two-Face, who apparently hadn't shown up for like 20 years or something like that at this point, oh. or at least since the 50s. You do get return appearances by the Man-Bat and the Ten-Eyed Man, who were introduced in Volume 5. Um, for those who don't know, the Ten-Eyed Man is one of the dumbest characters ever. He's a guy whose eyes were damaged, so somehow his op optic nerves were transplanted into his fingertips, so he can see out of his fingertips, which, I, I mean, I guess you could see in ten directions at the same time, maybe, but there's really no other benefit to that. Um, he even talks about how it hurts when he touches things with his hands, and, you know, if he makes a fist, he can't see anything, so I don't know. He was a really dumb character. Um, the Man-Bat was much better. He feels a lot like a Marvel villain in that he's a sympathetic character. He's not fully evil. But a lot of these stories, a lot of the Denny O'Neill stories, were really playing up the detective side of things, having Batman investigate mysteries and have clues. But you'll get your clues, and sometimes he'll even say, you have all the clues Batman has, reader. Can you figure out the mystery? And the answer is going to be no, because the clues are really stupid, and the mystery, <laughs> when you find out what the clues mean, is going to be really dumb. So that really did not work for me. That made it really goofy unintentionally, felt very Silver Agey, not in a good way. The art was cool. The Neil Adams stuff was cool. I really like what he does with Batman's cape in particular, but he does his typical overacting where if something happens, characters are going to be just, their eyes are going to be super wide, especially Batman. Whenever something happens, <laughs> Batman does this over dramatic turn looking back and just his mouth is wide open and his eyes are wide open. It just looks really goofy. I can picture exactly what it looks like. Yeah, I really don't like that. I like the way he draws. I like the way he draws people. His storytelling is good, but his acting is way over the top. And honestly, that's the biggest drawback for me from his stuff. The stories that I liked a lot more were the ones written by Frank Robbins. He was the one who handled most of the Man-Bat stuff in Volume 5, and he does a lot of standalone stories in here that have much more intriguing mysteries that actually play out in a more effective way and actually have more satisfying clues and actually make more sense. 
And even just the whole concept around them is better, I think, than a lot of the Denny O'Neill ones. Um, and he does draw some of his own stories, too. And his art is really unique. It definitely takes some getting used to. I think there are a lot of people that really don't like his art. Um, it's kind of cartoony and just weird. I think weird is the right word for it. But by the time I got to the end of the volume, I, I had come to appreciate it. Um, he's definitely a good storyteller. And I think the fact that he's writing and drawing a lot of those stories uh, really helps a lot. But it's definitely weird. And the only other villains we get really are Ra's al Ghul. You do get his first appearance in here, as well as Talia. Um, the League of Assassins had already been mentioned a few times before in Batman and in some Dead Man stories. But this is really the introduction of those characters. And I, I they were more interesting in the way that they weren't flat-out villains but it was pretty unclear what they were actually trying to do. And at one point, Batman decides he has to stop them, but it seems like his motivation for doing that basically is that Ra's al Ghul had outwitted him before, as opposed to saying Ra's al Ghul is actually a bad guy, even though that's what Batman says. So it didn't really work for me. Again, there was a lot of really goofy stuff, even in those stories. Um, there's one where Robin is supposed to look like Batman, so he wears an inflatable bodysuit under his clothes and it was just it was so dumb and there are a lot of moments like that in these stories that really did not work for me um so yeah i i can't say that these lived up to their reputation i was pretty disappointed definitely not among my favorite of the dc stuff coming out at the time and i finally beat resident evil 3 nemesis the original playstation version wow it only took you 25 years yeah this game was freaking hard it was so freaking hard. Even by the end, I was still struggling with a lot of it. Um, I do play it with uh, auto-aim off, which makes it more difficult. What difficulty? Uh, there's only easy and hard, so I was playing it on hard. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was really cool. Um, it definitely is not as good as the first two. It feels much less developed. And I know it was originally supposed to be kind of a side game, not one of the main entries in the series. Uh, but Capcom had made a deal with Sony where the next numbered entry in the Resident Evil series had to be on a Sony console. So even though they were already working on Code Veronica, which was supposed to be Resident Evil 3 on the Dreamcast, they had to then go to Nemesis and say, you know what, let's make it a full game and change it to Resident Evil 3. So it is still a satisfying game as a whole. It's definitely not as strong as the first two. Um, I think part of it is that the first two, you, you have a kind of a condensed location to focus on for a long time that you're going back and forth in. In the first game, you've got the mansion. In the second game, you've got the police station. And it, it really feels like you're kind of... Uh, exploring an area you know to the fullest extent and the puzzles make more sense there because you're going back and forth in the same area but in three you're just kind of out in the city and i can see why they wanted to do that that sounds like it would be really cool and when the second game started out you're out in the city and it was a really cool intro to that game but it doesn't make for as good of a game because you're kind of just wandering around much larger areas so there's less development to each of the areas because you're not spending as much time there and a lot of the puzzles don't really amount to much in the way of puzzles. It's basically just take this one item from point A to point B, or as opposed to having to find things and figure out what goes where and stuff like that in the previous two. So you're going to play the remake? I will at some point. Um, I know that it did not get a good reception because they apparently cut out a ton of stuff and uh, basically tried to kind of shove it out as just a cash grab after the success of two. Yeah, I got that impression also. Yeah, but I will play it at some point. I mean, I still haven't played the remake of 2, which is probably the single game that I want to play the most that I haven't played at this point. But yeah, it was cool. I also played through the Mercenaries game and actually beat it. Um, this is the first Resident Evil game that featured a Mercenaries mode, and it's basically the same as it is in the later games. And yeah, that was really cool too. So I would still definitely recommend this one. It was a cool game. And that's all I did this month. Holy crap. It only took an hour to talk about that. Yeah. So what did you check out this month? I watched The Guardians of Justice which is from 2022, and it's a live-action parody of Justice League-type stuff. You got characters like The Speed and Nighthawk and Marvelous Man. And it is live-action, but it also has animated and stop-motion and internet-flashy-type stuff. And I don't know if it was a way to save money, because it was too spread out. It didn't really work. It made it too disjointed. And something that also didn't really work is it flips back and forth between being a parody and asking the viewer to take it seriously. It's saying, hey, let me mock all these superhero tropes and how goofy they are, but we're actually telling a real story here. But the story could be from any of the things that they're making fun of. So that didn't really work. It's not very long, and it was an interesting experiment, but I didn't think it was very good. Any notable people in it? 
Diamond Dale's page. H- who? Ah. Is that a real person? <sighs> I watched American Beauty from 1999, which was Sam Mendes' first movie. I'm pretty sure he had done play work before this, so it was cool. And a lot of it is shot, kind of like a play. I remember everybody being over the moon when this came out, but it has not aged very well. It's very much a cinematic product of 1999. It doesn't have a timeless feel to it that other critically acclaimed movies do, even some from the same time period, like Wild Wild West. (laughs) (laughs) It's definitely not as emotionally deep as it asks us to see it as, and I think people read way too far into it and make all these inferences that don't really track. I do like the score, though. I imagine you don't like this movie. Uh, I used to like this movie, but now that you're saying this, I I wonder if I should go back and watch it again. Yeah, I used to like this movie a lot, too. It has been a while since I watched it. When I was in college and I was taking a film editing class, my instructor always liked to bring up how, before American Beauty came out, he had the idea to film a plastic bag blowing around in the wind. (laughs) And it was the most pretentious, stupid-ass claim that you could make. I mean, I think that's the dumbest part of the movie, American Beauty, from what I remember. And that's the part that he was like, I had that idea first, but I accidentally taped over it with my daughter's birthday or whatever. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) the guy was kind of an ass. He would also bring up Lolita all the time and talk about how great of a book it was, even though that had nothing to do with anything else in the class. So that was a little bit worrying. Sounds like a great professor. Yeah. I watched Elysium from 2013. How do you say it? Is it Blomkamp? Blomkamp? Uh, I don't know. I always said Blomkamp, but I don't know. His first movie after District 9. And I remember being really excited about it because I like District 9. But Elysium is such a generic sci-fi movie with ideas we've seen a hundred times before and doesn't really provide anything new. The characters are written very simplistically. There's nothing below the surface of the whole thing. Earth is overpopulated and crappy. And there's a big old space station where all the rich people live. And a guy wants to go up there. And he gets a brain implant that gives him information that the person in charge of the rich people want. So they go after him while he's trying to save all the people on Earth. There's nothing original about that, which isn't necessarily bad if they can present it in an original way. But that's not really done either. Yeah, that's pretty much how I remember feeling back when I saw it. And the fact that they reconstruct that one dude whose face is completely blown off was pretty funny. Okay, I don't remember that. (laughs) They have the chambers that can heal everybody no matter what, and the guy is holding onto a grenade that explodes in his face, and his face is completely missing, but they put him in the thing and they're like, his brain's still alive, even though it's been an extended period of time, and the guy's head is practically gone. It's kind of dumb. I watched The Munsters from 2022. Oh, man. (laughs) The only thing I knew was Rob Zombie made a Munsters movie. I was interested to see what kind of movie it was going to be. And of all the words I ever expected to use to describe a Rob Zombie movie, I never thought wholesome would make it onto that list. (laughs) Like I said, I knew nothing about this other than Rob Zombie made a Monsters movie. And for the first 30 minutes or so, I kept expecting it to get wild and gory and gross and obscene. Like it would start off as that 60s sitcom goofy style, but be a parody and turn into a Rob Zombie film, but it didn't. It was a straight up 60s sitcom style movie. It's like he said, I want the writing, dialogue, and acting to be exactly like they did it back in 1964. And that's exactly how it feels. It's really long, and the 60s sitcom style jokes and performances don't really hold up today. It's like he made this movie solely for himself because he loved the old show so much. The whole movie was weird. The way the actors are acting would have fit right in with the 60s episode. So I was confused and disappointed when it was over. I watched Clash of the Titans from 2010. And for those of you who don't know, Clash of the Titans was originally made back in 1981. And this remake did not need to be made. Perseus is played by Bland Worthington. (laughs) And there's a bunch of 3D CGI garbage flying at you the whole time. That's the movie. And it somehow led to a sequel. Which amazed me, because I don't know why you would look at this one and go, yep, none of the actors seem to give a shit, and Ray Fiennes' chain-smoking problem was in full swing back in 2010, and it really showed here. It's the same story as the other movie, but I don't understand how it could turn out so badly. And the nods to the original movie are so stupid. 
Why was this movie even made? I'm asking you, why was this movie even made? <laughs> Desperate cash grab. Cashing in on your nostalgia. Just like everything that comes out nowadays. Yeah, but this was 12 years ago. Yeah, I, I was surprised that you said it was 2010. That was a long time ago. I'm still waiting for the third one. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were going to make it, but they said, hmm, other two movies were so disappointing. The fact that they made two and said the two movies were disappointing, <laughs> not the one was disappointing, so we decided not to make a second one. They said the first one was disappointing, but we still made a second one, and because both of those were disappointing, we're not going to make a third one. I don't understand the movie studio mentality, but I do think I would be very successful there because I'd make stupid decisions. <laughs> I can waste money. I cast Bland Worthington and tons of stuff. Look at Avatar. He's coming back. I've been watching the Rings of Power show, which is from 2022. It takes place before Lord of the Rings. And one of the main characters is Galadriel, who was played by Kate Blanchett in those movies. The production design is pretty good. And the show itself is leaps and bounds ahead of The Hobbit. It's not even worth comparing it to those piles of trash. I've heard that a lot of people are upset because it apparently completely contradicts a lot of Tolkien established stuff and kind of doesn't seem to have like the spirit of what he was going for. Well, people make the same argument about the Lord of the Rings movies too. Okay. I'm pretty sure his estate has completely disowned those movies. Hmm. Or at least his son. Outside of Galadriel, there are other groups doing other stuff at the same time. And it is interesting how entire episodes will focus on just one group doesn't even cut over to what the other groups are doing which at first was kind of off-putting but their stories are full enough that they can afford to do that and i also think it's great they didn't go immediately for the big name celebrities to fill these roles like every show and movie does now i'm gonna keep watching this show i thought the opening episode was weak because they felt like they had to entice people to watch it by sticking in a bunch of lord of the rings stuff that's potentially an indication that you don't have confidence in your product and it had the opposite effect on me, because I said, if this is just going to patronize me, I'm not going to watch it. I already saw The Hobbit. But after that first episode, it started telling an actual story, which was good. I'm not a Lord of the Rings purist or super fan. I think as a show, it's working fine. I also watched The Two Towers from 2002 and Return of the King from 2003. I think it was a smart move for Peter Jackson to shoot all those back to back. And it's clear of just how much he cared about what he was doing and wanted everything to be as good as it could possibly be. Yeah, and that way you don't have to deal with the hobbits growing a foot in between each movie as they age. Okay, I was misinterpreting what the hell you were saying, and I was like, no, they only have two feet the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> the casting was good, because that is an issue you run into when you cast young people into stuff. Look at Stranger Things. In season one, they're all three feet tall, but by season four, they're all 40 years old. I wouldn't be surprised if season five, they do a flash forward type thing, where they have totally different people playing them as adults. Hmm. But I was talking to someone to work about it, about the parts we really like out of those movies. I really like when the beacons all get lit. And when they light it, this really cool Howard Shore music buildup plays as it travels across the world. And eventually just bursts into the motif of this city, which is really cool. And when the first one gets lit, you see the dick guy in charge. And there's this really cool camera shot where he just has this look of pure disgust on his face. And he kind of drifts back into the shadows between these two pillars. It's so cool. And the music plays and it reaches all the way to the other side. They go to the king and they're like, what are we going to do? And the music just stops. Total silence. And the guy goes, yeah, let's go get him. And then the music starts playing again, but it's that area's motif, which is really cool, very effective. Howard Shore knows what he's doing. But that's one of my favorite parts from that one. I watched the first half of The Two Towers, but you didn't watch The Fellowship? Uh, I tried, but I fell asleep. Uh, <laughs> I was actually really excited when they were first airing on TV. I had seen the animated ones, at least parts of the animated ones as a kid, and I thought they were cool. So I was really excited for those. Set up the VCR, I was recording it, I fell asleep. I never went back to try to watch it again because I thought it was so boring. Um, and then I did watch the first half of The Two Towers, and... I remember liking it. I remember thinking it was all right, but I said, you know what? I'm going to go, I think I said, I'm going to go take a shower <laughs> in the middle of it. And I just never came back. <laughs> well, you should give him a shot. It's so hard. I, I do want to watch the behind the scenes stuff because that stuff I do find interesting, but I doubt I'll really be that interested in the actual movies. And I tried reading the books too. And that's also where I, I stopped in the books. I got halfway through the two towers and I said, you know what? This is not for me. 
I watched Screamers from 1995. It's based on a Philip K. Dick story. So there are miners on other planets, like mining stuff, not children. <laughs> but they uncover this new type of radiation, so they say we're not going to do this, but the corporation is like, you're going to do it. So there's this war between them, basically. And these machines called Screamers have been invented, and they travel under the ground, and they make a screaming sound effect, and they leap out and attack people. So the story focuses on one of the miners from these planets, played by Peter Weller, and he finds out that they've been duped and the war has been over. So he goes to make peace with the corporate people on that planet. And the opening part of the movie made it feel like a made-for-TV sci-fi movie, and I was kind of turned off. But then once they start their trek, it was a lot better. I thought it was worth watching. Some cool effects, for sure. Some bad acting, for sure. But overall, pretty cool. Okay. You've sold me. I'll check it out. I watched High Risk, which was released as Meltdown over here from 1995, which was a Jet Li movie. And a lot of comparisons are made to Die Hard, which isn't really that accurate. There is a building. People are trapped. There are terrorists. And Jet Li has to, you know, help everybody. But there's a lot of comedy in it, too, in addition to action. And I know I talked about Hitman a while ago. And how it kind of felt like a Jackie Chan light movie. Well, in this movie, there is a guy who was a direct parody of Jackie Chan. <laughs> so he's a big film star. And Jet Li is actually his bodyguard, who doubles as him for stunts sometimes. It would have been so good if they actually got Jackie Chan for that character. The guy does a halfway decent impression. It was pretty funny. The movie was cool. I would recommend it. This is probably my favorite Jet Li period. I'm sold on that one, too. I watched Life Force from 1985, which I have not seen before, but I think you have. Uh, I tried to watch it one time, but I got tired of just the girl walking around naked the whole time. It just felt like there was nothing else was going to happen. But I have seen enough after that that makes me want to go back and watch it. I was super surprised how cool the special effects were in this movie. The story was simple enough, and it was written by Dan O'Bannon. Is that correct? Yes. Who I think gets an undeserved amount of praise for his work on Alien, because I don't think he was actually that integral to it by the time it was actually made. I think he might have done a lot for Screamers, too. But it seems like he was the go-to guy for a long time for sci-fi stuff. I did see another movie he did called Dead and Buried, which was okay. And it also started with a naked girl, so I kind of figured that was his thing. So a group of astronauts finds a ship that's really big, and it has three people in kind of snow white cases and they're all asleep and it turns out those people are space vampires which is exactly what it sounds like i think the original title of the movie was going to be space vampires so instead of drinking blood they drink space <laughs> <laughs> so they suck out the life force from all these people which eventually those people come back and suck the life force out of other people so it's just this plague that spreads across the whole planet and all of the life force is going back to the big ship which is in orbit, so the main dude has to stop him. But the standout thing for me was the special effects that were so good. I know Patrick Stewart is always billed as being in this movie, even though he's only in the movie for 10 minutes, maybe, and it's not even that big of a role. And this was distributed by Canon, which, again, totally matched your description of being hyper-American, but feeling like a completely foreign film. Mm -hmm. I see that the international cut is 15 minutes longer. I assume it's just more footage of the girl walking around naked. Yeah, in the making of, people were really surprised that the movie was even able to be released because there was so much nudity. I watched Fright Night, but the 2011 one, uh. which has, what's his face, Chekhov. Um, yeah, Chekhov. And the Peter Vincent character is played by David Tennant. I was surprised how quick they jumped into what was actually happening in this one, which I'm not sure happened as quickly in the original movie. Colin Farrell plays, um... The Penguin. <laughs> Colin Farrell plays... Bullseye. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> plays the titular vampire. His name is Fright Night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Colin Farrell in anything, and this movie really wasn't an exception. I like him in some stuff. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Special effects were... Very computer-generated. I mean, the effects are part of what's so cool about the old one. Right. Yeah, at the end, when Colin Farrell reveals his final form, it was pretty dumb. I did like David Tennant's performance 
overall. I thought he was a little over the top, but in the movie, he's supposed to be this big Chris Angel type celebrity. So it kind of made sense. Uh, Chris Angel's the magician guy. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> I watched the RoboCop remake from 2014. Just remember, your record of all your life mistakes is permanently going to be out there. The main dude is like a Brian Thompson clone. <laughs> That's all I could think of when I was looking at him. Yeah, I could see that. And the RoboCop theme sounds like it's from a dumb 80s TV show. You mean in the old movie? Yeah. I think it's fine. I think it's supposed to be kind of like over the top goofy. Right. But they play it in this movie, which is trying to be super badass and gritty, which doesn't work. This movie was really dumb. It's basically RoboCop. Go watch the old one. And the old one had satirical elements. I would say the satirical elements are almost the point of the old movie. Right. That's all I watched. I read a collection of short stories by Philip K. Dick that were the basis of the Amazon show Electric Dreams. And these are short stories. We're talking 10 pages, and there's about 10 of them in this book, and they were all pretty good. The ones I really liked were The Hanging Stranger, The Father Thing, and Autofac. The Hanging Stranger is about this guy who goes out and sees this guy in the public square pretty much just hanging from a lamppost. He's dead. And he starts to ask people about it. He goes to the police, and everyone kind of just brushes him off. And he's just, and he's amazed that people can just walk past his body and not have any reaction. And they're all like, well, it must be there for a reason. I mean, otherwise people would be freaking out. So he starts to think he's going crazy maybe. And then as he pays more attention, it turns out there's these insectoid alien bugs that are replacing people coming out of this portal, which is really weird. And he's wondering if he's imagining that or if it's actually happening and he starts to suspect other people are actually these bugs. It was pretty good. And it felt like a 50s story with the ending, that Twilight Zone-esque twist at the end. The father thing was about a kid who knows his father is not his father. He's been replaced by an imposter. And that story was super good of how he has to prove it and then what actions he takes to stop it. I really like that one. And Autofac was about these big automatic factories that make everything that humanity needs and delivers it, but it's using all of Earth's resources. And the people don't actually need the stuff that the factory is outputting, but it just doesn't stop. And they're trying to figure out a way to make it stop so it doesn't wipe out humanity, basically. So this group of people blow up a delivery truck to make all the supplies fall out, but then they're like, well, it's just going to deliver more stuff. So they have to try and figure out how to open a communication with the AI of the factory to try and tell it we don't need stuff anymore. None of the stuff you're delivering is being used. We want to rebuild ourselves. It was very interesting. So I did watch some of the episodes of the show. And the thing that disappointed me the most, I think, was that it set all of the stories in modern current time. Except for the ones that were in the future. They were actually in the future. And it loosely followed the stories. And again, these stories are 8, 10 pages, but each episode was 45 minutes to an hour. So there had to be more things injected into the story to make it last that long. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I read Superman Last Son, which was written by Jeff Johns, Richard Donner, and illustrated by Adam Kubert? 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 I think it's Kubert. It involves General Zod and his two cronies, and introduces Christopher Kent. Actually, I don't know if it's the introduction of Christopher Kent, but he was a child born inside of the Phantom Zone, and is actually Zod's son. Why is his name Christopher Kent? That's the name that Clark and Lois give to him when they adopt him. So his name isn't actually Christopher Kent in the Phantom Zone. It's something like Blalel or something. <laughs> well, actually, it wouldn't be L. It would be something Zod. Yeah. So Zod and his cronies escape from the Phantom Zone, and they pretty much take over Earth. And Superman has to stop them, but he wants to keep Christopher Kent from getting sucked back into the Phantom Zone. It was actually pretty good. Is this a standalone story, or is it in continuity? It was originally Action Comics around 850. There's a Phantom Zone section, and they give you 3D glasses. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing more StarCraft. I got through the Zerg campaign, which I enjoyed. I've been playing a lot of Splatoon 3, which came out this year, which is good. There's a lot of new stuff. I'm enjoying the Table Turf Battle, which is basically a card strategy game. It takes the concept of Turf War and transforms it into a card game, which is cool. But I've been doing a lot of Salmon Run, 
I finished the campaign, and I've been doing Turf War 2. I'm enjoying it. I also played the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Cowabunga Collection, which is a compilation of a lot of Ninja Turtles games from over the years, including the Arcade One and Turtles in Time Arcade, which to my knowledge have not been ported to anything else to this point. So that was cool. You got the three Game Boy ones, you got the three NES ones, you got all the versions of Tournament Fighters. I guess I didn't realize the NES had a version of Tournament Fighters, so that was cool. It's got Hyperstone Heist, Super Nintendo Turtles in Time. I think that's everything. And it was cool to play the arcade ones, but it just showcased how much better the Super Nintendo version of Turtles in Time is than the arcade. But it is cool to be able to play with four people. Online is a nice feature to have, but it is not very good. A lot of input lag and just crap. But the real standout for me was all of the behind the scenes stuff. I guess in the past, a lot of rights have been owned by different people to do different stuff. And now Nickelodeon owns a bunch, but then you got Mirage Comics, Konami. It was all over the place for like movies and the TV shows and the games and the whatever. So the fact that so much of this is compiled in one spot is very impressive. You've got entire design Bibles for a bunch of these games. You have tons of behind the scenes content. I was so impressed. There are over, I think, 3,000 pieces of content. The fact that it's like, here's a filtered search for all of this stuff was wild. For the Konami stuff that's all in Japanese, for almost all of it, you can put on an overlay of translation, which must have taken forever. Yeah, that's awesome. The fact that they even found this stuff, probably in a Indiana Jones type warehouse that Konami has somewhere, and then translated it is really cool. It's nice that we're in this era where collections are becoming a thing, but they're being handled by companies that actually care about it. And, you know, you think back in the day on, you know, PS1, PS2, whatever, when they collected something, it was usually crappy ports or things were just wrong. Yeah. We're at a point where for a lot of these collections, they're handed off to people who say, I actually care about the material that we're collecting. Speaking of that, I played the Capcom Fighting Collection which is a bunch of Capcom fighting games that is not just Street Fighter. And I think there's one or two games on this collection that haven't been released over here officially, so that's cool. I like fighting games. I like Capcom fighting games. I'm not going to pretend I'm good at any of them, but they're cool to play. And I've been playing Bridge Constructor Portal, which is a bridge constructor game with portal elements. And I don't think I'm going to play through all the levels, but it's a fun little distraction. And that's all I did this month. So thanks for watching. And join us again for next month. Yeah, lots of Halloween movies because it's October. Yeah, that's what I was going to say.